Check this out. This episode's all about ghostwriting. It's all happening. Static selector. Ghostwriting is a loaded term. It's regularly weaponized. It's been used in a lot of rap beefs as an attempt to damage an MC's credibility. We've seen online conversations question the impressiveness of an album or song if it seems like there's too many writers on it. We've seen presumed ghostwriters attempt to spin off on their own to varying degrees of success. There's a stigma that you're less talented if you need more help. The irony is that the term ghostwriter is used so widely, so interchangeably, that the definition is often lost in translation. The original term meant someone who wrote something for someone else and never received a writing credit for it, often never received payment either, across all genres, not just hip hop. They're just ghosts, but it can be more nuanced than that. Norve Denton is an A&R with Warner Music. He's worked on scores of records with different artists. He's also the host of the Blueprint podcast, link in description. Norve breaks it down into three specific categories. Roll the clip box. Most people that use ghostwriters actually write themselves, right? Um, they're, they're legitimate artists and, and they don't give them right. However, um, they call it help or support or collabing. You know what I'm saying? No one ever goes out and says, yo, I need a fucking ghostwriter here right now. And that's some million vanilla shit, right? But what happens is you working on a project or whatnot, say you coming up and, you know, a lot of times cats got people in their camps, like a homie um, that's been rocking with them for a long time and they kind of polish records up for them or whatnot, or they go back and forth with ideas to give them motivation and inspiration. And sometimes if I'm, if I'm that homie that you bring in and you're the artist and you just got a deal and I'm rocking with you, I'm on your home team anyway, man, you might be going back and forth like, yo, he gonna say, bro, what you think about this line? And then, you know, I'm coming in like, okay, cool. Well, how about this? You just like this. And then you end up just collabing or whatnot. I'm writing for you technically. You know what I'm saying? I'm writing for you. Now, if I get inspired and I come with a verse hard as fucking, you're like, bro, okay, we're gonna go with that verse. That's one way it transpires, right? Kanye West's My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy comes to mind when I think of Norvay's depiction. There are fantastic tales of a glorious gathering of hip hop luminaries crafting the potential classic over in Hawaiian hideaway someplace, RZA and Static Selector and Pusha T and seemingly the whole creative world working on one magnum opus, reveling in creativity. So I had the princes work with Kanye West for years. He describes how deep the vibe can get. We don't just do music for the base level of music. It inspires other things like fashion, uh, you know what I'm saying, political views, different things like that. So when we when we have people in the room, it's not just writers in the room. He might have a preacher in the room, he might have a designer in the room, like a, a stage designer. We need to have uh, a fashion designer, then we have a publicist, then we have two producers, then we have a dope ass writer, a rapper like me and that motherfucker. When he, when he raps the song, he want to see how it affects all cultures, not just musically. So he bring a lot of people in that shouldn't be in, but he brings them in to see, hey, if I, if, if I play this song, what do you see me wearing when I'm rapping it? Mm. Or if I play these, like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, should I put a mask on? Should I put this? What does this song make you feel like? So he doesn't just put the opinion of one genre or one style of art. He likes all, he might have a, a graffiti artist just come in there and listen and tell him what he sees from a graffiti standpoint, what messages, is, you know what I'm saying? How will he correlate it in graffiti? They see things in different facets of life. It ain't just you know, just what this song means to you musically is what it means to you, you know, physically, fashion-wise, emotionally, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, can you make a movie from it? The music is just a soundtrack to everything that he wants to do that may be extracurricular. That's why it's different type of people in there. It ain't just... Rappers. <laughs> you know description adds another layer to Kanye West's live show. When you see a mountain and a mask during the Yeezus tour or the floating stage for Life of Pablo, you can also see those concepts coming at the same time as the sounds themselves. A lot of people think we're just, when you see all those names on his phone, you think everybody just sat there and just wrote every lyrics for it. It ain't like that. It's just people who help get the thought across. You know what I mean? That could be from all different angles. That's how I look at it with, you know, music and just writing in general. It's just kind of just trying to figure out what they want to, what message do they want to convey. 
Preachers getting credits on rap albums, Jesus. That's microeconomy like a mud scudder. Now that was collabing. Norve also talked about how sometimes artists need additional support to help round out a project to make it more commercially viable. That's where the label may feel like an artist needs something leaning towards women or leaning towards the clubs. That's really common too. Norve's third example though, riding camps. That's when things really get engineered. You know, then you got the third option of somebody just being waiting in the rafts, waiting in the wings and you know, coming up with whole records for you sometimes. Um, and you know, they, they call those references and that's when you get into the whole Drake thing uh, where like, yo, there's a slew of beats, huh, put them up. You know, they got writing camps or whatnot. They got writing camps the label might have, writing camps where you don't even meet the dudes. They put, they, they come up with the records, they put, you know, put the records, record them or whatnot. And you know, you listen to them or whatnot. And it's like, oh shit, I like that one. Who did that? Or it might be somebody in your camp that does the same thing, but it can be organized and, um, um, it can it essentially can be organized and uh, put together by either the artists themselves in a private certain sitting um, with you know known writers that they just fuck with or your label can set it up your management team can set it up writing camps are real publishing companies do it all the time some of your favorite artists get this support. Writing camps sound much closer to assembly line music than Kanye style collabing, for example. Much colder, much more manufactured. And that's where hip hop fans get critical. How dope is an album or a song if it's delivered? Amazon Prime rhymes ain't dope. A few things remain consistent. No one's mad at anyone for taking hooks. Ghostwriters these days most often time get paid. It can be through ASCAP or just straight up cash if your publishing isn't set up. Norve also talked about how many artists are on retainer, making $5,000 to $15,000 a month just to be around, just to stay locked in. Not a bad living. Ghostwriting can be a great way to break into the industry. Kanye talked about ghost producing for No ID on the college dropout. Lil Flip stopped by and talked in detail about freestyling, lyricism, and ghostwriting. Flip breaks it down like this. Roll the clip out. It's a lot of rap rappers and artists and R&B people that they wrote hooks for these R&B people and get a lot of checks and they fine with being in the background, you know what I mean? And, I mean, sometimes you gotta come in through the window just to be able to walk out the door and to walk in the door. And I tell my people all the time, you might want to be known as the rapper, but if you're great at like hooks, man, like, like, like my artist Freon, you know, who I deal with, man, and he's crazy, incredible when it comes to hooks. Like, he can sing it with auto-tune, without auto-tune, like he's dope. I put him on the spot numerous times. He's on like seven, al seven records on my album and shit is crazy. And I was like, hey bro, you might want to, you know, go around doing a lot of hooks for people and get your name out there as a hood guy, kind of like, and then follow back. And, you know, he's like, man, I want to I rap. I said, I understand, but you look at Kanye, you know what I'm saying? He wanted to rap first and, and, and it didn't work out how he wanted to do. So what he did, he went hard with his beats, produced a lot of the blueprint shit and shit for Scarface and everybody. He got his name out as a producer. It made him go back to the drawing board and work hard on his raps and his punchlines and it made him a monster, you know what I mean? And sometimes you gotta come through the window to be able to, to walk out and come through the door. Word up, thanks Flip. Make sure you check out Flip's new project, the KEP, currently available, links in the description. The point is this though, ghostwriting carries a stigma in hip hop. Hip hop doesn't tolerate artists who lean heavily on ghostwriters, call themselves the GOAT for example. But the story of ghostwriting really feels like a story about culture. There's a community that forms through collaborating, through vibing in the studio. The number of people who are able to make a living without being the face adds to the music economy, keeping people employed, even the microeconomy like Norvay described when he talked about the artists on Retainer. Some of the greatest music in hip hop history is a product of writing camps. Dr. Dre never hid the fact that he leaned on other artists to craft his classics and that he did that made his music infinitely better, if not best ever. All of this keeps culture pushing forward, keeps culture growing. Is any of this possible if rap was limited to individual talents? How far would we be in life or in rhyme if we only went for Dolo? I don't have the answer to these questions. That is
another Saturday. It's all happening. Thank you guys for rocking with us each and every week. We appreciate it. We've been talking about this piece for a while now. We got caught up in a couple of topical topics over the past couple of weeks, very newsworthy things, but I really do believe that there is a big upside to ghostwriting. I want to know what you guys think about it. Should we be upset, for example, if we found out Jay-Z was collaborating in the studio, someone had a harder verse than him, and he put it on his project? Is that really that bad? He's still Jay-Z. We know he can rap. Does that take away from a GOAT status if you found out a legendary MC had that situation and put that out on their own? Let us know that in the comments section. Also, make sure you check out Saha the Prince's BET Cypher. He laced it. Thank you, Saha, for talking to us for this piece. Thank you to Norvay. Thank you to Lil Flip. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow at the company man on everything. It's all happening. No disrespect to any artist, but you got some artists that made it like on a, a B-list you know, star level that all we do is rap for the culture to entertain the culture. But it's sometimes when our culture needs to be represented outside of hip hop and it's on another realm where if it's in the Grammy world or the Met Gala or, you know, just a, you know, just in a nutshell of just music period when people speak on who's the representation of the culture, you would think it would be Kanye, your JP, your Drake's, your and so on and so forth. I feel like that's the different correlation. That's where you have to come together as a, a team. Because some hip-hop don't even make it to white America.